So this is an analysis of the birthmark by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Um, so 19th century American writer, probably best known for the Scarlet Letter. Um, most of the things that he wrote reflected his like Puritan background. They were highly moralistic. In fact, he would hold these moral values kind of up as exemplary. We see that a lot if you remember the Scarlet Letter. Um, and then points out that men very infrequently can attain that high moral standard. Um, this particular story um, was originally published in a literary journal, probably one of his more famous short stories. Um, and we'll talk about the story itself in just a little bit, but I wanted to talk first about the time period that it was written in. So this is the late 1700s, early to maybe mid 1800s. So science is kind of on the rise and um, there was this kind of blurring of the lines between science and philosophy and spiritualism. And how much of what is experienced is has scientific explanations, and how much of what is ex, you know it is experienced as philosophical and religious kind of connotations, and ex, you know that kind of thing. So there was a school of thought called positivism. Posit, good Lord, positivism. Um, which was pretty much like the scientific method on crack. Um, the only way that we can learn things uh, is through science experimentation and observation. Uh, so, the, the school of thought, this positivism, that we nothing can be attained um, through any other manner than the scientific method. And you all remember that from your science classes. So, that's just a little bit of a quick background behind and so now we've got this story. It's told in third person omniscient. So we get an omniscient in third person. Obviously, we get the outside view. It's not a character in the story. But an omniscient narrator is all knowing. He can see, or he or she can see thoughts and um, actions, what the characters say, as well as what they do. So we get a lot of that. Um, that whole scope, that whole circle picture of the story. So we've got this man, this man of science, as we find out, a proficient in science and natural philosophy, um, who is very studied, and he's on the quest for a great discovery. So like every other um, scientist uh, wants to leave his mark, no pun intended, um, and make a great discovery. So, he is very, um, you know, very committed to his work, and then uh, he says that he clears his fine countenance from furnace smoke, washed the stains of acid, and then persuaded a beautiful woman to become his wife. And so, this woman was absolutely beautiful. In so many ways, she was absolutely perfect. Everything that he had ever wanted in a um, in a in a spouse, with the exception of one thing, um, she had a birthmark on her cheek that he describes as a small hand, like this a small hand print on the side of her cheek. Now, keep in mind. Everything else about this woman is perfect. Her mannerisms, her personality, her character, everything. She's beautiful with the exception of this tiny, tiny mark. Um, and so, he marries her. And he is, um, in the beginning, I guess he thinks that the mark will... Um, you know, he'll be able to overlook it, but it begins to eat at him. And so, he doesn't like anything 
that is flawed. And to him, this uh, mark upon his wife's cheek is the ultimate example of this phenomenon. She's beautiful, um, and yet she's flawed. And he believes that he holds the key to remove this flaw from from her. Um, and so, and, and he puts a kind of spiritual spin on it. Um, in the story, um, this, this flaw represents her humanity to him. It represents her liability to sin, um, decay and death. And it's deeply interwoven with Georgiana's countenance. So, obviously, we know that he is an absolute fool to think that he can rid her of this mark without some kind of consequence um, from a small to a grand scale. Um, however, he believes that he has the power to do this. Let's take a pin in that for just one one second. And, you know, the time period that this was written, this was a big, um, the scientific world was all a, uh, um, a blow with all these different ideas. But this story is still very relevant today. Um, you think about what science um, can do these days as opposed to then. I mean, my goodness, removing someone of a birthmark, absolutely, we can do that. We have the, um, the technology laser, um, removal to remove tattoos and birthmarks and something like this is absolutely possible today. But more than that, there is that philosophical question of just because we can, does it mean that we should? Is it okay in in a grander scheme to play God? God makes people the way that he wants them to be. Is it okay, moralistically uh, correct, for us to, to tempt fate or try to play the hand of God? Um, cloning. Um, gender assignment, um, and I don't mean that like a deciding that you want to be, you're going to start calling yourself a male. I'm talking about, but in vitro, can we change the sex of a baby? All these scientific experiments, is it okay for us to play, play God? Um, and so. This hand, let's go back to the hand, the birthmark. This tiny hand uh, is the hand of God. It is a symbol of the hand of God. He has placed his own mark. Her creator has placed his mark. God has made her unique for a reason. And so Hawthorne takes that and puts his own little twist. He contorts it to fit with his agenda. Um, he contorts that as... Uh, a sign of her humanity, a sign of her mortality, a human hand, if you will. So, he convinces her that she, he will love her more if, um, if she has this uh, removed. And he just beats it and browbeats her and browbeats her into, into deciding that, you know, this is, in order to make her husband happy, this is something that she needs to do. And she really kind of jumps into it, like, wholeheartedly. Let's get rid of, let's get rid of it. My husband will love me more. Whatever he wants to do, that'd be great. I love this part here. Had she been less beautiful... If Envy Self could have found aught else to sneer at, he might have felt his affection heightened by the prettiness of this mimic hand, now vaguely portrayed, now lost, now stealing forth again and glimmering to and fro with every pulse of emotion that throbbed within her heart. But seeing her otherwise so perfect, he found this one defect grow more and more intolerable. He is literally completely focused on this flaw, and it, and it distorts all other aspects of her her um her countenance so 
he has this self-deception that he is actually smarter and more intelligent and more advanced than he actually is. He's already failed at, at several other experiments. Um, and then add to that, he has a dream that the birthmark literally goes so deep that all the way to her heart. So, to remove it would destroy her. And yet, it still eats at him to the point that he has got to get this out of her countenance to make. And it becomes more about what is his true motive here? Is he trying to make his wife more beautiful, more perfect? Uh, and is it for the right reasons for her or is it for him? Or is it for the glory of some scientific discovery that he's willing to kind of force down all these red flags that say, dude, this is probably not a good, a good idea. And so, you know how the story goes um, to the end. So, at the end, he both succeeds and fails. Um, he's successfully able to rid his wife of her birthmark, but he kills her in the process. So, science has its limits. Uh, man cannot play God. Um, what I really want you to get from this story is, and, and I really want to hear your, your viewpoint on it. What do you think his true motive was in this story? I'm actually going to ask you that on a CTE. So, collect all of your evidence. Read through my lecture notes. Get you some evidence together and get ready to make a claim and back it up. What was Almer's true motive? Um, is it was it perfection of his wife or this glory of a scientific discovery that in, in, in playing God?